as well. Yeah. But let's, let's do it now. Anything you want to ask about, and then after, talk about the fight, press conference, what we can talk about it all. But I mean, Bose has got, got to go and get the belt because they've got it. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're still gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna start on time, yeah, just without the belt, right? <laughs> Hi, Matt. Hi, Matt. Just message me. How you doing? Don't worry about this. Yeah, let me just uh, post this video. Sure, sure. And then uh, take the time. You got the, what, the, the most profitable boxing business now? Oh, okay. We saw that artist. <laughs> we saw that artist. It's only Forbes, I mean, you know. Not a big deal, right? Oh, now I'll just tell us what's going on. I'll just tell you. Right, let's get this in the background, boys. Yeah, I'm just getting very close and personal here with you. I mean, Eddie, you just mentioned it, right? So let's start there. You know, you, you get a lot of a love, I'm sure, back home, but you, you got some opposition here in the States from some other promoters at times, right? Well, I prefer to call it fear. Fear, okay, okay. okay. Fear of what? So, I mean, look. Fear, fear of being at gun. <laughs> yeah, and you know, the Forbes article just came out, right? And some of the people that are your detractors, like Oscar, or Leonard at times, not always, you're not always his favorite. Um, they don't always have the most stable things to say about you, but you're ranked as the number one boxing promoter. What are your thoughts on that? Well, we're the only global promotional company in the business. So look, you, you can always debate who's the biggest in what market, right? But one thing you can never debate is who is the biggest globally, because we're the only global promotional company in the world. You know, we're doing 35 to 40 shows a year. We're in the UK. We're in America, we're in Mexico. You know, this weekend we have a show. We're in Australia, Italy, Spain, Saudi Arabia, Abu Dhabi, everywhere. So we're on another level to all of the promotional companies as a global business. But you've always got the debate of who is number one in the US, who is number one in the UK. So, you know, I think it's all good. You know, I mean, you have to understand I've also got a job to do to raise my profile in America to, to become you know, a face of the business and a face of boxing or a spokesman for boxing in here. And when you've got people like Oscar de la Hoya, who is a legend of the sport with a huge profile, saying my name all the time, or you've got Javonta Davis, who is one of the faces of boxing, saying my name all the time, it's very good for me. So I like to just wind them up a little bit and keep them talking, you know? Eddie, what's the logical next step, Eddie? Look, I mean, the logical next step is, for me, there's a lot of work to do still in America. Like we've had tremendous success, obviously with Canelo Alvarez, you know, with, with huge fights with him. And now, you know, you look at our schedule, obviously we're in Puerto Rico with Subriel Matias. You know, we've had a great run with Devin Haney in the past. You've got Jerome Boots Ennis now, which was a flagship signing for us. You've got Bam against Estrada, June 29. You know, we had Dimitri Bivol, who's got, got big fights coming. So we're, we're in a great position, but now I think it's time to start signing these guys up. We've had probably six or seven of the top 20 pound for pound fighters in the world come yeah, on to course, us in the last yeah. month wanting to sign with Matrix. One of them was Jerron Ennis. But I think my worry is always that we can't deliver on our promises. And I would never sign a fighter if we can't deliver. And the worry is, is that you sign too many fighters and then they become inactive. We've seen it so many times, right? So I want to be really selective on who we sign but I do think it's now time to, to gobble up two or three of these great talents and really give them the platform and the promotion that they deserve. I mean, it still baffles me. You've got a guy like Boots, who in my opinion may be in an argument for pound for pound top five within 12 months, right? And it's like, we went on sale yesterday. We had four and a half thousand tickets. That's all we had on a free sale. We sold them out instantly. How on earth? has Boots Ennis not boxed or headlined in Philadelphia. It's absolutely crazy. I don't understand it. Is it laziness? Is it you want to keep him in a box? Like, you know, and if you look at what we did when we took Devin Haney to San Francisco, we sold 16,000 tickets at the Chase Center. Like, and you've got to sometimes roll the dice a little bit, but you're not really rolling the dice when you're headlining him in his own city where he's born and bred in a, a sports city. 
like Philadelphia as well, with a great venue like this. So we go on general sale today. I reckon at the end of today we'll be at, I don't know, six, seven, eight thousand. We've got nine weeks to go to the event. You imagine you're Jerron Ennis, you walk in here today and you look around and you go, fuck me, I have arrived. My name is everywhere, I'm up on the Jumbotron, you guys are here, my press conference is in Philadelphia, we've sold out the, the lower bowl already nearly. Like, it, it's such a great feeling. And for a special fighter, that's where you're gonna get the best out of them. When you make them feel like a star, you know. But the ones that perform under this kind of pressure in their home city, they're the real stars. And, and Jerron Ennis is a star. And I like this kid, Cody Crawley, by the way. You know, I've seen him up the rocky steps this morning. He's 22 and 0. I think he won't be good enough on the night, but he'll be bringing it. So let's see how Boots is. And anything less than an A star performance from Boots is not good enough because he, we've got to win these titles at 147 and then he's got to go and fight Terence Crawford if Crawford could come through Madrimov. And every day that passes, I still think to myself, Madrimov is going to flatten Terence Crawford. On August the third in Los Angeles, as much as I love Terence Crawford. Eddie, Eddie, because it's safe to say you have now two of the most young killers on your team. You got some real Matias and now signing Bootsy. With him having his first, like you said, this is shocking to everyone why he hasn't ever headlined here in Philadelphia. With that being said, are you a secret mastermind genius for signing two of the young killers in all of boxing? You know how long I've tried to sign Jerome Five years, right? I had my first meeting to sign Jerron Ennis on the Danny Jacobs Canelo Alvarez fight week at the MGM Park Hotel. I remember it, right? Five years ago, everyone was talking about Jerron Ennis. This kid coming through, I'm telling you, this is the one, right? For a year past, we tried again, three years. But in the end, Sean Palmer and Kevin Rooney, shout out to those guys at, at Matchroom, they're going to me, oh, We've had another meet. We, we think we can sign boots. I'm like, guys, please don't waste my fucking time. You're like teasing me, you know? Yeah. It's like every time you sort of, you, no, no, and then you pull it away from me. And then, you know, once we knew that we could get it done, it was a massive signing for us because you look at that division as well. You know, the timing's so good. No one's going to want to fight Boots Ennis. But you've got people now who are champions at 47 that will look now at Boots as their payday, right? Barrios, Stanionis. What other fights are they going to be? They need to be looking for the boots fight, for me to pay up, or a site fee to pay up, or wherever to pay up, to give them their payday. So I want him to see him beat Crow Crowley, then I want to see him unify against Barrios, or Stanionis, or those kind of guys. And you know, His Excellency has already said, he loves the Terence Crawford boot tennis fight. You know, I took him to see him, and, and he knows he's boxing, and he knows. And But the thing is with Terence, Terence also knows, right? Terence thinks he can beat anyone, and he's a pound for pound, great, I mean he's a legend of the sport, but he also knows he's boxing, and he knows how good Boots Ennis is, and he'll fight him, but only for the big bag, you know, so we got to make the fight big enough for someone to pay the big bag. And I mean, speaking of his excellency, I mean, obviously what he's doing in the sport is sort of, you know, disruptive in a good way, um, you guys have obviously built a relationship globally, but now he's coming to do his first card here in America, can you talk about just, I guess his end goals and the conversations that you guys have in terms of what you're looking to build? Yeah, I mean, for him, he has an unbelievable energy and love and passion for boxing. He feels, you know, I'm not putting words in his mouth, but he said it in interviews, he feels that the sport is slightly fragmented and broken, and we've got to work together to deliver fans what they want. And no one can argue that so far, the fights that he's putting on are delivering for fight fans. I mean, August 3rd, especially if you talk about Wilder potentially against Jared Anderson. I mean, that's the greatest fight card I think the country's ever seen. So... Obviously, the vision is there, but honestly, this isn't a guy that's just coming in going, spend, 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 and like, I don't really know what I'm doing. He has a very sharp mind, and he has a vision for the sport to take it forward. Now, whether that vision will work, if you've got the appetite, you've got the passion, and if you've got the bankroll, I think it does work. Um, but it's going to take everyone to stay together, to keep making these fights. You know, when, when we was in New York recently, just before the... the um, the press conference, you've got everybody on the phone, you, you know, I'm there, Louis the Cubist is next to me, we're making fights, you know, Golden Boy are on the phone, top ranked on the phone, and it's like, he's the one in the middle, because we, you know, we all know that Oscar's not going to want to make fights with me, right, PBC aren't going to want to make fights with me, he's in the middle, brokering those fights, we're seeing them get done, so he's doing a tremendous job to do that, 
and you know, I think August 3rd is, is going to be an incredible. Eddie, yeah, Eddie yeah. do you see? You mentioned the pre-sale. You mentioned what you can do over the next nine weeks. Do you see this building being more of a consistent or maybe even permanent home for Jerome Ennis? I mean, this has to be his home. You know, if we can bring unification fights here, it, everything stems from July 13th. And, and what I mean by that is, one, the amount of people that are in the building, and two, more importantly, the performance. You know, we had a chance once. When, when Demetrius Andre boxed in Providence against uh, Suleki, right? We sold about 8,000, right? It was, it was a brilliant atmosphere. The city really came out. He knocked down Suleki in the first round twice. And then it went to points, right? And it's like, if that, if he would have taken him out in the first or second round, we could have really built off that and gone again. And that's the same with Jerome. If Jerome comes here and it's not a good performance, if he squeezes out a points victory or he <coughs> loses, people aren't gonna buy into it. I can't stand here and tell you this is the second coming of Mayweather or Crawford or these guys, and you don't go in there and look sensational. The pressure is on him to look sensational. If he looks sensational on July 13th, they'll come back and they'll come back again, and this will end up being Boots Ennis' home. Hey, Eddie, Eddie, real quick, um, I know we probably spoke on it many times, but I know Ryan claimed that he wants to get a B sample. I know that they said that he didn't feel for two substances, he still feels for Austin and A sample. Just, what's your whole thoughts on this? Situation. I mean, I get I get a lot of hate. I, I read my DMs the other day on Instagram. There's a lot of Ryan Garcia's there. Oh, yeah, yeah, stop yeah. doing this to Ryan. Stop that. Like, this is a really simple situation. Ryan Garcia failed a drug test. Two drug tests. When he entered the ring that night against Devin Haney, he had performance-enhancing drugs in his system. Now, I've seen the stuff about the levels. I think it was reported. 60 times, 60 times the level of what you're allowed. It's quite, it's quite a lot. And you can talk about it's only point this and point that. Guys, come on. Right. Now, what I've said before, and I've said it again, to Ryan Garcia, to all the Ryan Garcia fans around the world, I really hope he's innocent. I even give him the benefit of the doubt. Right? I like innocent until proven guilty. But we have to deal with the reality, which is this. Whatever happened, whether he cheated or whether he was unlucky, he had performance enhancing drugs in his system when he boxed Devin Haney, okay? Unlucky or not, that's fact. Therefore, the contest will, in my opinion, 100% be a no contest. Not that it actually, I'm not say really matters. I don't think Brian Garcia is overly bothered about his record. I think Devin Haney is more. But all I'm saying is right now, if you're Devin Haney, and you're thinking to yourself, oh my God, I went 12 rounds in a war with that guy who came in three and a half pounds over, who was God knows how many pounds heavier than me on fight. And on top of that, he had performance enhancing drugs in the system. You imagine how Devin Haynes feeling right now. So I don't get any of this, come on God. I mean, look, like you've got the Conor Ben situation. I went, oh, I've been in it, I'm still in it. We're still having hearings about it. It's two years on, right? And by the way, and I'll you know I'll talk further about this in time, but what was found in Conor Ben's system was much, 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 much less than what was found in Ryan Garcia's system, right? And I fully, fully believe Conor Ben, right? Been through various hearings with him, and Ryan's got to go through all these hearings. Like I say, I give him the benefit of the doubt, but what we can't do is just ignore the reality, which is he had performance enhancing drugs in his system in the fight. And I'll tell you one other thing. I mean, I listened to Javonta Davis. It's so painful listening to this guy. He, he, has, he knows absolutely nothing, right? And he's like, I don't know if you saw the clip. He's like, yeah, what I want to know is, like, how comes they let him fight if he had it in his system? He's like, the test's on Friday and Saturday. Yeah, but why didn't they get it back within three days? In no part of testing, in the history of part of testing, has any result come back in three days? It takes anywhere between like 10 days absolute minimum and sometimes up to 28 days to get a result back. In fact, funnily enough, when that result came back, we also received a result from Joe Cordina, a negative result, on the same day of testing, the same day that that other uh, test came through on, on April 20th. Right? So there's nothing untoward about the period of testing. One of the things that people keep talking about, and they do have a point, 
this whole, what is the point in testing on Friday and Saturday if you're not going to get the results back in time and you allow someone to enter the ring? I disagree with that. You still have to test to find out if someone did cheat. What are you going to do? Stop testing two weeks before and go, okay, guys, uh, we're not going to test anymore. You can do what you want. So, you know, I don't know enough about these substances. I don't know enough about the nanograms and pictograms and all this bullshit. We deal in reality, which is this. He entered the ring of performance enhancing drugs in his system. Okay? Now he has to prove that he didn't take them intentionally. If he didn't take them intentionally, I feel really sorry for him, and I hope innocent prevails. Innocence prevails. If he did take him intentionally and he cheated, that's another story, and he, you know, arguably should never be able to fight again. I believe him in this situation because I want to give a fight the benefit of the doubt. I don't know him, I've never spoken to him. When you're sitting there saying, oh, I wasn't taking pets, I was smoking weed and I was drinking every night and then you see clips of him and IV drips in and all this sort of stuff, it ain't a good look. So if I was him, just stay professional at this point, let your lawyers deal with the situation. Hopefully he was unlucky, but we have to go through due process. Eddie, Eddie, Manny Pacquiao Fonaben was pretty much there to be done, but we're still going through the process. As I said, like this is a lengthy process. I mean, we're two years in and we're still having hearings. Conor Ben has boxed twice, but he hasn't been able to fight in his own country. You know, I would say that's ridiculous, two years on. So we'll see what ban Ryan Garcia gets and see how that reflects on the Conor Ben situation. But, you know, again, you know, Javonta's comments, oh, he was going to let Conor Ben fight uh, after he failed a drugs test. Not at all. It's not my choice. He's down to the commission. All of those reports go to the commission and the commission makes their decision. I don't overrule the commission. And in this instance with Ryan Garcia, the New York State Athletic Commission will be the ones ruling on this. No one else, right? It won't be the WBC, it won't be any governing body. It will be the New York State Athletic Commission will decide the fate of Ryan Garcia. Eddie, Eddie question, but you just mentioned a little while ago, you know, uh, building Matchroom up and it's time to grow the sport here in America, or grow the promotion here in America. You're looking to gobble up some fighters. Canelo just had a fight a few weeks ago, or a week ago. You guys have a relationship. Could you see yourself, one, potentially working with Canelo again? And although I know you mentioned Bud Boots being a potential fight down the line, Bud has shown a lot of interest in wanting to fight Canelo. What do you think about that as potentially being something that could happen down the line? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, right now, the only fighter in the mix I have, well, two fighters under contract for that is um, Edgar Belanga, who's a man victory with the WBA, uh, Dimitri Bivol, who obviously has the victory over Canelo Alvarez. Um, the, the most important thing for me, I mean, unselfishly, is to make sure that the zone continue airing Canelo Alvarez fights, which they do a great job of doing. And, you know, they had a very successful time with the Gear fight, which was on the zone, and also Amazon as well. Um, not speaking on Canelo's behalf, because I don't represent him, I don't think he's overly interested in the Terence Crawford fight because I think he'll be thinking I'm not going to get any credit for beating Terence Crawford who's a 147 pounder who's just moved to 154 you're asking him to move up to 168 and fight a guy that's going to massively outsize him and also at this stage in Canelo Alvarez's career stylistically I'm not sure he wants to fight a mover that he's going to be chasing around the ring and I think that was the case when he boxed Charlo I don't think he enjoyed that fight I think he enjoyed the Munguia fight because it was a young big super middleweight coming to win I think he'd have the same kind of enjoyment out of an Edgar Belanga fight but money talks I mean you know the one thing you know about Saul is he is all about the money and what I love about him is he don't try and hide it you know what I mean? <laughs> he's, he's achieved everything. He's got the belts. He's got the legacy. There's nothing else to do other than be in fights that motivate him and be in fights that make him money. And that's why when people criticise him about the 200 million from Benavides, I actually think that's a great play. Because you never know. Someone might pay it. But what's the point in coming out and saying, give me 75 million and I'll fight Benavides? Because someone will just go, done. Give me 200. You know, as I say, shoot for the stars, and if you miss, you land on the clouds. Shoot for the clouds, you miss, you land on your ass. With 200, so, 200. from you, maybe? Possibly. No. Are you in Turkey? <laughs> 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 I'm just asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Listen, but look, whether it's 200, whether it's 150, whether it's 100, I like the style. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, hey, you look, you motherfuckers. <laughs> you want me to fight Benavidez? You want that fight? Pay me. If not, I'll fight Belanga next, or I'll fight him, and then... You know, I do believe... One thing I promise you about Sal, knowing him, 
he ain't afraid of no one. No. I promise you he'll fight anyone. He has no problem fighting Benavides, no problem fighting Crawford. It's all about the money. But he does he does want to be in exciting fights, I know that. Eddie, so, hey, I have a question, question for Belinga. Belinga. You were saying that uh, most likely the, the fight between him and Canelo is most likely gonna happen. We're looking probably what so it's the, the fall, of September, maybe October. Where are we looking to have this fight? And what can you get to have the the no the non sayers who say that Eddie's not um, that Belinga's not ready for a guy like Canelo? Yeah, listen, that fight's not done, we're not in negotiations with that fight. All it is is the egg is the man okay. for, for Canelo. So at some point he's gonna have to fight. You know, I appreciate there are bigger fights out there for Canelo, but if they don't materialise, why not fight your mandatory? Why not have a young super middleweight that can punch, that will try and come to win? You've got a guy from Puerto Rico, you've got a guy from Mexico, you know, Edgar likes to talk that smack as well, you've seen him. And I think he's a big fight. So I think, of course, Benavidez, Crawford, they are bigger fights than Edgar Valanga. But if they're not available, and you have a mandatory like Edgar Valanga, I think you make the fight happen. Eddie, 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 real quick. Yeah. So, um, I know you made some changes with your matchmaking a few years ago, and Raymond Wolf's match was very tough. Mm. What can you say about his development and his progression and plans for him if he does win in the yeah. five match? So, Ray Ford, one of my favorite fighters. I mean, he came into markets in New York. Uh, God knows how old he was at the time, 19, something like that, 18. And he came with all his family. You know, he was like, <laughs> and uh, we, had, we had such a great conversation. I promised him, you know, if, if you do everything you say you can do, I'll, I'll guide you to the World Championship. The win against Oleg Komatosh was such an incredible fight on ESPN. Um, he was our first world champion that I signed in America from the debut. And he has a special place in our heart. He also has a very tough fight against Nick Paul coming up. Um, I believe he wins that fight in style, and I believe after that, we bring him home. These you know? match really tough on his way up, yeah, is that yeah, part of the plan? Yeah, but also, sometimes, right, the, the reality is, when you've got a good young fighter, and you're championing him, and you're, you're trying to, you know, you're bigging him up, I don't see the value, and, and, and you know, we're boxing Ray all over the country. You really, there's no value in giving him six, eight round scrubs. You know, I see a lot of um, prospects right now that are fighting in terrible mismatches, and they're good enough to fight at such a higher level, right? And I think that kind of matchmaking that Ray Ford has had will put him in such a better position now. Like, I don't think if he would have been in those fights, I don't think he would have beaten Oleg Common, right? But it's the fact that, you know, he had a draw once, which was a terrible decision. He won that fight, but there was another fight where he got the decision. It was actually a very close fight. But all of those experiences, fighting on the road, and, you know, they've, they've built him into what he is today. So matchmaking is key. Ray Ford, I think, is the best 126 pounder in the world. He won't be there for long. He'll be up at 130, whether it's the next fight or the one after that. So, but now you've got this little area, you know, I mean, you've got him, obviously from Camden. You've got also Khalil Co from New Jersey. This kid can really fight our light heavyweight nice. prospect. I believe he's going to be world champion. And he'll fight on this card as well. He's got a lot of support from, from New Jersey as well. So we've got a really nice team growing. Ray Ford's a big part of it. And, and Eddie, you, um, there, were, there were rumors had the Crowley situation not worked itself out. Connor Ben may have been sitting at the table today. A, is that true? Not really, no. No, no. No, no I mean, you know, Crowley was the mandatory. We really want to get the mandatory boxed off yeah. because we want to make sure that we've got the freedom after that to fight who we want. And I like the fact this Crowley, 22 and 0. Talks a good game. He's undefeated. Good. He's with the PBC. Shout out to Louis de Cubas and Tom Brown. You know, we couldn't do a deal, and then we did a purse bid, and then I ended up paying less than I'd offered them. Which I don't really understand, but it is what it is. And you know, Crowley's here to win. And uh, Connor wasn't in the conversation for this date, but he wants to fight for the world title, and we have a champion at 147. If Raymond, Raymond Ford, Ford, Ford and Noy in a way, is that possible? Sorry? Mm -hmm. I said Raymond Ford versus Noy in a way. Yeah, I mean, I think that in a way, you know, there's t I talked uh, yesterday in Phoenix about Bam against Inoue. You know, Bam is going to move to Bantamweight at some point. Obviously, I feel like Inoue is probably outgrowing even Super Bantam now as well, but he's probably going to move up to Feather at some point. And that could be a fight for Ray Ford to take at featherweight before he moves to Super Feather as well. Obviously, it's a big money fight. And the only way that Inoue is going to be, get beat is to go too far through the divisions. You know, you see it often. Even Lomachenko really is a, is a 130 pounder, you know, and he was a 126 pounder. So he started getting beat when he was fighting guys that were probably a little bit too big for him. 
Um, you see that a lot with guys going through the division, and that's probably what will happen to Crawford as well. So, you know, Ray Ford against Inoue, absolutely, but got to get through Nick Ball on June the 1st. How has your reception been here, Eddie, in Philadelphia? What's the plan for him? Does he plan on getting in the ring with a legitimate threat? I think Berlanga against Mungia is a great fight. Right you off know, the bat of a yeah, game loss? Yeah, because I think at the end of the day, Mungia is not going to want to take a step backwards in smaller fights. That's a huge fight that could be made. And if, if Edgar Berlanga doesn't get the Canelo Alvarez fight, my advice would be let's try and make for the Jaime Mungia fight. Would Berlanga be willing to take that fight in Los Angeles if necessary? Yeah, he'll fight, he'll fight him anyway. It's a huge fight, but you know, obviously he's focused on the mandatory with Canelo Alvarez. Teddy, Teddy, what about Danny Jacobs after that? When are we going to see Lee Wood back in the ring? That's a good question. He actually messaged me this morning. So I'm seeing Ben Davison in Riyadh on Tuesday, um, and we're going to try and reignite this Josh Warrington fight. You know, back home, that's a big fight with a big rivalry. And obviously, Lee couldn't make 126 anymore, had to vacate his belt. He's in the last stages of his career, and hopefully, we can make the Josh Warrington rematch. Would well, you say Lee Wood doesn't want to make Corey Corey Moulton, the one that Floyd said he wanted to fight Lee Wood? Is that still yeah. too soon? I mean, that's a big money fight, maybe, right? I will see three and I, four and I, or something. I don't know. Do you like that potential fight? Because you know there'll be you and Floyd yeah, promoting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I watched him on the pads the other day. That's all I've seen of him, really. Oh, all looks nice. All this. <laughs> you, say Oscar, a proper fight. you say Oscar doesn't want to make fights, so, so is this a realistic possibility to get Mungia and Berlinga in well, the hopefully, ring because year? really DeZone, who is the boss of Oscar De La Hoya, should be and me, oh, but I don't mind saying it, that's a difference. <laughs> now, one thing I'll tell you, right, the, the difference, it's very difficult for Oscar, being a superstar and being a pound for pound great, to understand that all these fighters are his bosses, right? You see, a fighter that I signed, Raymond Ford, the day that he signed a contract with me and he debuted in a four-rounder, he was my boss, Ray Ford, at 19 years of age, in a four-rounder. I worked for Ray Ford, all the way up to the top, of course, to the Canelos, to Ron Boutini. He is my boss. I don't mind saying it, but you know these promoters, see like Bob Aaron? You, you try and get Bob Aaron to say that, that some kid in the sixth round that is his boss. He fall over on the floor because they come from a different era where the promoter is Bob I don't agree with that at all. You know, I'm not saying I don't make mistakes, but one thing I would always say is I work for the fight. Well, you said Top Rank's not a global promoter. You stated the Turks are a global promoter. The Top Rank, they just did a show in, in Tokyo. They're doing one in the They didn't really. It's the Honda did that show. They represent Inoue and they look after his U US shows. They're not the lead promoter in, in these territories. We are the lead promoter with TV contracts in those territories that do consistent shows. It's like me saying, you know, it's like Top Rank saying, yeah, we're promoting Fury Usyk. No, they're not. Fury Usyk is a Riyadh season event promoted by His Excellency. They have a fighter on that card, just like when I have AJ fight in Saudi Arabia. That's not my show. I'm not the licensed promoter for that show. You know? So, yeah, look, top, top rank are a good company. And they're probably the nearest thing, I think, on the fourth list. I think they were next to mine. But they are, you know, they have a global brand, but they're not active in markets. That's the difference. Eddie, Eddie, how's your reception you been here so in Philadelphia? Just a question for you. Obviously, we spoke about Ryan a bunch already, but what do you think about Ryan calling everybody out, but he's not talking about boots? Oh, did you see his dad's reaction when I mentioned his name? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. he, he, about he switched yeah. up. No, motherfucker, you fucking man. Who you got for me next? Boots. Hip hop. What? <laughs> what? Yeah. Listen, there's no secret in the game how good boots is. But I keep saying it, and I, I, I get it. The only way these, gonna, these guys are going to fight Boots, I'm talking about the big names, is if the money's there. And we've got to build Boots into an attraction so that all of a sudden Ryan against Boots is a mega fight. Is How it, many fights away is Boots from being that attraction? Could be one, could be two. You know, I mean, we, the response that we get from you guys here today, look at this turnout, right? The, the numbers across digital and social media, now the numbers in box office. I don't think we're a million miles away. Like, I've never had a response to a signing like I had when I signed Boots. Is that really? why you picked the Wells Fargo Center? The Accor Center in Philly has been a staple for big TV yeah, fights in Philly, staple. except for fuck Wells Fargo. Staple. This is how you do it. Right. You've got a superstar. We go to the biggest fucking arena in Philadelphia, and we go to the best arena, and we make it our home. I'm not interested in going to a small arena, building, starting. No, it's about the narrative, it's about the story, and it's about promoting a star in this city. We can't just creep in. 
And this is like, you know, a lot of people, and maybe I, maybe I made a mistake when I come to this country where I didn't creep in. It's not my style. I'm not a creeper. I'm a crash bang wallet, <laughs> fucking whatever you want to call it. But that's what it is. It's not like, hi, Boots, what we do is we'll start in the Leo Corey Centre. I've been to the Leo Corey Centre. Really nice. I did a Ted and Farmer show there. We actually did all right. Katie Taylor fought on that guy as well. That's not selling a dream of what this kid can achieve. If I thought Jerron Ennis was at his level and maybe he could unify, maybe, maybe I'd be in there. But this has got to be his home because he's that good. How has your reception been here in Philadelphia? I've only been here for... Uh, one night right. but you know I've been here before we've done a show here before we had a great time but I just feel like it's a bit like when we went to San Francisco big sports city never had boxing but this as the Wells Fargo this has never had a fight uh, as, as the Wells Fargo you spoke about your resistance in uh, the United States though and there, let's be honest about it, there's no major fights within the Baltimore division. Would he be interested in... I think Barrios is a big fight. Well, I, I mean, that's not, a, a big that's not a bigger fight than Virgil Zoo winner. Would he be interested oh, yeah, in that yeah, Virgil yeah, Zoo winner? I just feel like he will fight any of those guys. For me, I would like to see him unify and become undisputed at 147 before he goes to 54. But if his excellency picks up the phone and says, right, it's Crawford in December, we're all in. Eddie, Matchroom and the Zone have been putting on amazing promotion. Like you guys been doing these movies and these videos, like they're going through the world. Is this just the tip of the iceberg and what can we expect in 2024? Because this is attracting a lot of people yeah. and you guys yeah, opened up a new way. You know, a lot of the video stuff, you have to really thank His Excellency and people like that for the vision. One thing I'll say about the Zone, five years ago, or however long it was, six years ago, I came to America with a big budget and with a platform that no one had ever heard of. Right? It was an act. People were laughing at acts I had at boxing, it. right? So, I was sitting down with fighters. I remember my one of my first meetings that I had, I sat down with Mikey Garcia. Right? And I was trying to explain to him what oh, an app was and in boxing and how this was going to be the home of boxing globally. And he's like, so what? So explain to me again. You know, so you watch it on your phone? It's like, yeah. And even I'm selling it, I can sell anything. But even I'm thinking, this is a tough sell. Over the test of time, there is not a, a, a major fight that is not on the zone, right? I mean, last weekend you had Canelo you had Garcia against Haney before that. Next week you've got Fury against Lucy, globally. You've got Bivol Betsy, I know, rescheduled for 5v5, right? You've got Matias coming up, you've got Bam Estrada, you've got Jerron Ennis, you've got all of our Catrell against Taylor. But it is quite simply the home of Summer's, like, it's, it's high. such an unbelievable, <laughs> so, like, there's no, no, platform can compete with the zone in terms of their schedule but still we've got the improvements we've got to keep going but i just feel like we should be embracing that platform as fight fans and people that work in the school because at first like such a it's such a weird world the boxing world that you live in but i always laugh you know you've got like the pbc guys and you've got like the matrim guys just everyone, just like, let's just love the sport. PBC do amazing things in the sport. They do some great shows. Top ranker, a great brand, great company. They've got great fighters. We're trying non-stop. The zone just delivering again and again, boxing every week. So, you know, tomorrow we've got a big show in Mexico, right? With Rocky Hernandez and Erica Cruz. And then next week we're in Riyadh for Fury Usyk. Then the week after, we've got Catrell Taylor. Then we've got the 5v5 after that. Like, the run is incredible. Boxing has never been in a place like this. But let's all be friends. Let's have a big group cuddle. Not now. <laughs> and let's just, let's just enjoy a golden golden time for the sport. How many times can we expect Ennis in the ring for this year after this fight? <coughs> I mean, I'd like three, in, from including July 13th. You know, it's difficult because when you box in July, August, September, October, and then after that, can you get out again in December? But the key is activity, but the key is also big fights. I'd rather stay active, but in the right fights, rather than just fight Crowley and then fight another guy and then fight another, you know. One of the problems, I don't mind saying it, you know, one of the problems I had with Demetrius Andre was I couldn't deliver him those, those big marquee fights because the marquee names didn't want to fight him at the time. So I ended up giving him all these other fights to keep him active. But it's, no, but it's just like, you, you're kind of wasting his, his ability. So with Boots, I want to you know, get him on the leash and then let him go. And then let, yeah, exactly, yeah. So it sounds like Barrios is the next target. I would love to fight Barrios. Mm, now, but we've got to come up with the money. 
Same with Stanionis, they're champions. <coughs> but, you know, when it was Crawford, when it was Spence, when it was these guys, if I was Boots, I'd probably be looking at Matron going, how are you going to get me those fights, right? Now, you look at it and say, well, it's actually open market. Stanionis wants a payday. The biggest payday for Stanionis is probably Boots. Mm. And the same with Barrios. So, but we've still got to come up with the money. And the way that you do that is to build the value of Boots, which is a zone, who love him already, and in here, Some where, yeah, where you can go, oh, they've sold out the Wells Fargo for Cody Crowley. Fuck. What's going to happen when he fights Barrios? Mm. Like, that's a big fight in Philadelphia. So, it's the start of big things, July 13th. What about Boots versus Conor then? Yes, yeah, possible. I mean, Conor's going to want to fight for the world title. and. You know, I would, I would rather Connor fights a Barrios or a Stanionis. <laughs> boots. Oh, I've said to him, you know. And by the way, you know, Connor said to me, I want that fight. I want that fight. I said, listen, this is a, this kid's a hell of a fight. I know, I know. I want to test myself against the best. So, if Connor Ben wants to fight, maybe we bring Boots over to the UK for one fight. You know, the UK have a huge base of very knowledgeable fight fans, and they would love to see Boots Ennis fight in London. Trust hey, me. Question: We know that Khalil Cole is on the card of this fight. Are you looking to bring Khalil over across the pond? And yeah, possibly, but I want to build him. You know, when you talk about American light heavyweights, I know you've got big old vets here, those guys, but let's be honest, like, he's still not been a division. Joe Smith had a decent little run, now up a cruiserweight. This kid, you know, he's selling, when, when he boxed at MSG, he sold a lot of tickets, and he'll be selling a lot of tickets here as well. I'm ready to step him up the world rankings now. Oh, this kid's a serious fighter, big power. All right, boys? Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Eddie.